Yeah, thank you very much, Camilla, for introducing me. It's a great pleasure to be here in presence and have the opportunity to speak. It's a really um, great experience. I will give a talk which uh, will be separated into two um, talks. One is on the backboard, the second half will be uh, on slides. And uh, to start with, I would like to discuss in some detail a key example which in some sense should capture a basic problem in the theory of deforming partial differential relations and uh, or solutions to partial differential relations while preserving uh, the partial differential relation. So um, let's fix small number. And we study flexibility around point zero in the reals. What kind of functions? For smooth functions f defined on the reals, um, which satisfy the property that the first derivative is bounded above by, bounded below by minus. Okay, so we find a solution, an obvious one, it's the zero function. And of course, this property here, this defines um, a partial differential relation of order one. So let's see what happens. Um, what do I mean by local flexibility around zero? Um, I assume that I deform this solution, a given solution, for example, the zero function in a small neighborhood of zero and try to extend this uh, deformation to all over R. So um, this means I start with an open neighborhood of zero, open. I take a family of functions parameterized over time, and here I have points x. Um, I assume that at time zero, as the zero function which for solves this partial differential relation and when I take the derivative with respect to the x parameter, so this should satisfy the partial differential relation for all okay, so let me draw a picture. What's going on? With the reals, we um, start with the zero solution, and then I um, yeah, just look at a family of solutions to this partial differential relation, satisfying that the first derivative is. Uh, greater than minus mu. Um, an open neighborhood, which may be smaller than mu, which is um, contained inside here. I want function, 
which is now defined on the whole of R. Again, starting at zero. And of course, I wish to satisfy the partial differential relation for all times. And I also wish that um, these deformations now coincide with the given one. U zero and outside of U, they stay constant to the given initial solution. And now let's see what we can do. Yeah, so the the picture should be like this. I, I try to find a smaller to zero and would like to take given solution over U zero and connect it to the zero solution outside of U. And of course, we see it here in this picture. This cannot work in general. There is an obstruction. Namely, if we move the value at the point zero during the deformation large f, there is no chance. So we see that um, this can only work if this value stays constant. In T, otherwise we cannot solve this problem. It's a very basic observation, of course. And now, but if we say, okay, uh, let's uh, follow this obstruction. And um, let's try to look at the picture where during this deformation large f, the value stays constant at zero. We get something like this. Carefully. Um, something like this. So here we again have the um, neighborhood u. And now I, I'm again looking at a smaller neighborhood, U0, and trying to connect the, this local deformation around zero to the constant function outside of U. And here we see, um, so here we have a chance. Do this and now I would like to figure out how we do it explicitly. So we have to find um, yeah, some interpolation between the given deformation large f and the initial solution of our partial differential relation, which is small f zero. And of course, we can um, do the following. We use um, cutoff function to fix notation. I um, choose an epsilon such that the small interval minus epsilon to epsilon is contained in U. I take some um, secondary parameter. You will get. You will see in a second why this is important. And I want to take a of function defined on the 
non-negative reals. This is smooth cutoff function. Um, which satisfies. Yeah, okay, so what do we have to do? I would like to multiply the time parameter with this cutoff function later on. And this means that in a small neighborhood around zero, it should be one, and outside of u or outside of epsilon, it should be um, zero. So, um, I write in the following way. This is true for all radii, for all parameters smaller than delta times epsilon. This is why I introduced the parameter delta and zero for r bigger than epsilon. And now let's see what happens if I um plug this into my uh deformation large f so i take the following function ftx yeah so what can we do we take the of the given deformation large f and then i plug in this cut off function which I have here in front of the time parameter. And here, of course, R is um, the absolute value of X. So this is the, kind of the tentative solution to our problem. And now let's see what, uh, whether I stay in the relation or not. So I have to uh, make a small computation. Namely, I um, have to take the derivative of this function in x with respect to the variable x. You really want to put it in front of the hyper. Yes, I want that. And I um, compare this with the derivative of my initial information with respect to this variable x. And of course, when I just take the derivative in x direction, I know that this thing here stays in the relation. This is fine. But when I compare this with the total derivative of this function with respect to x, I get an additional term, which comes from applying the chain rule to the function big F. Uh, since I plug into here a function which also depends on x. And so we do that computation. Yeah, here I get um, a derivative with respect to the t um, slot. This is the first slot of big F at the point tau delta epsilon r times T x is this derivative, but then we have to take the derivative of um, tall also. And uh, it's now our task to estimate this difference here. And if it's small, if, if, if we can make the right hand small, then we are in business since our relation is open. And so we are staying in the relation. I don't know if that works. Maybe not. I cannot write. 
Mm. Yeah, if you want to use all three of them, you have to start with the video. I mean, okay. Uh, never mind. Let's do. Let's try to do two things. The first thing, the first guess, is we just take a usual cutoff function for tau. So this means um, I just take delta is equal to one half. And I take for tau delta epsilon r, I take a cutoff function phi, which looks like this, one half here, and the usual picture. And I take r over epsilon. So how does the second, so how does this term behave now? Let's see. For this choice. Um, okay, so um, one thing is important here. So this function vanishes on zero since ft zero stays constant in t. And so we can estimate up to some constant, which stays fixed during the argument. This can be estimated by r, right? Times some constant, times the derivative at the point zero in x direction. This thing here, this function, um, this can be estimated by, uh, by something like one over epsilon. And if we take the product of those, and this is estimated by one, this is not good enough. Right. So I do the second guess, which is that one. Namely, what I'm doing now is I do not change epsilon anymore. So, so this, I mean, this is roughly bounded by one for um, any epsilon, how small I take it. So here I leave epsilon constant and I um, leave delta variable. And um, here I take the following cutoff function. I draw the graph of it. It stays constant one until um, the point delta epsilon, and it gets to zero at the point epsilon one. And the graph of this function looks roughly like this. What function is it that I'm taking here? I can uh, define it. It's the logarithm of L of R over epsilon is divided by the logarithm of delta. And of course, I here I have to smooth smoothen the function here and here. I do not want to go into that discussion. But you see this function is now a zero um, away from epsilon. It's one in a small neighborhood of zero. And now let's see what, what happens here. Again, here I have my usual estimate. Now what happens here? So let's take the derivative of this function. We can do it in our head. It's um, one over this thing, so it's epsilon over r. And then I have to multiply it with one over epsilon, so it's r, one over r, divided by the logarithm of delta. So this thing is bounded above by something like 
r to the minus one times one over the logarithm of delta. Of course, t is, uh, stays between zero and one, so that doesn't cause any problems. And now if I take the product of those two things, then this goes to zero if delta goes to zero. And so that's fine. With this cutoff function, we can work. And in some sense, actually, that's more or less it. So that's the bone of what I want to tell you. And of course, I have to add some meat now. Um, but this is really the crucial observation. So we, if we work with the correct cutoff function, and the trick is that here, this is kind of too rough since we know if, if x gets smaller, we have more room here. And so we find a cutoff function which takes care of the r it has the same order here and here. Okay, and now um, with this observation in hand, we see, yeah, we we can um, find this extension of um, our locally defined uh, deformation, and so we are happy. And actually, now we can formulate a more general, much more general theorem. But it uses basically the same construction. Kind of like a fun Kai's question is it is it is it clear that it doesn't work if you put the cutoff function outside of f, or is just there some advantage to? What do you mean? It, why not put? I, I guess it would be more standard to put tau sort of outside of f instead of the t input. It doesn't help. I mean, if you do the computation, you with this cutoff kind of function. <clears throat> so, but, 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 but of course, kind of you can do also just take uh, take our function f and complete it there by linear function or something. Yeah, sure. I mean, in this in this simple picture, you can do it by hand, right? I mean, no, no, not by hand, but just take 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 your function up to interval so the maximum function is just less than mu say over half. And then connect by linear function from this to no this does this right. because if you take a linear function then you have this no no but the, 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 the derivative will be just exactly one over mu if you if you no but okay but it doesn't matter you, you can... yeah um... maybe somewhat related to this can I ask um, so you're also kind of localizing in time I guess. Like FT is not little FT is not equal to capital FT. Uh, around zero it is, since um, this cutoff function is constant to one in a small neighborhood of zero. And outside of this, I um it's I also thought okay. Okay. okay, I see. So let me formulate the theorem. And uh, we call it the local flexibility lemma. Proposed by Romov. Six, and I proved it together with Christian Baer. Yeah, so we can now add the meat. This is, I think, pretty obvious what, what we can do down because actually now we, we have a theorem in general's jet space theory. So, okay, now let it write it in the most general possible way. This is how we like to do it in uh, jet bundle theory. We take a smooth fiber bundle. Um, we take a closed subset.
Here, it's, it's of course the trivial fiber bundle with fiber R. Um, I take partial differential relation in the total space of the kth jet space bundle. So it's a partial differential relation of order R. Next thing is I um, take a CK solution of my partial differential relation in this simple case in this key example this is uh, the zero function um, next yeah so I have to write down uh, what I mean by the local deformation um, I take an open sub uh, an open neighborhood and I write it in this way now this is uh, interchangeable but um, does make sense from a systematic point of view so I take a continuous path it's enough to have continuity in the time parameter And each um, each section of this bundle over U. So this is the space of CK sections of uh, the bundle X over V, but we just take uh, sections over U such that each FT solves R over U. And um, I also assume that F zero is equal to F zero restricted to U. And I have to add a condition here that we saw already on this blackboard on the K minus one jet. So this has to stay constant. Otherwise we do not have any chance in general. So the K minus one jet of this, uh, during this deformation should stay constant. Right. Okay, so now, some sheets. Local flexibility holds, and you can guess what the theorem is saying, um, but I write it anyway. Then the conclusion is uh, there is an open neighborhood of zero which sits inside this given neighborhood. And um, continuous path of CK solutions, but now over. Um, continuous path. So this is continuous and each FT, each FT solves the partial differential relation such that, and so the crucial properties are that uh, this deformation starts with um, Given solution and um, uh, on the smaller neighborhood U zero, it's exactly the deformation 
and outside of the um, neighborhood U coincides with the initial solution. Okay, so this is um, this is the local flexibility lemma, and uh, so we can write the proof quite easily if we make another assumption, um, namely that zero in B is a closed submanifold, closed smooth submanifold. Uh, since then, uh, yeah, and actually, and, and also I assume here for this sketch proof that all functions which appear here are actually smooth. So I have a smooth path and not a continuous path. Uh, all functions are smooth. So this, um, I tell you, so this can be, I mean, this can be done by a, a, an approximation scheme, but this, this uh, assumption here, this is not so clear why. Um, so what this has to do with the general formulation of the theorem. But anyway, in this case, if we assume these things, I take an auxiliary Riemannian metric. Auxiliary, auxiliary Riemannian metric. I take an epsilon, take epsilon larger than zero, such that the distance function to f zero to, uh, to, to v zero is smooth in the epsilon neighborhood, such that distance function to v zero is smooth on the epsilon neighborhood of V0, and of course we have to remove V0, there it's not smooth. And then we just can set um, F T. It's now the same formula. I uh, take the time parameter for plugging in cut off function, maybe this one. And um, uh, take delta sufficiently small. Okay. And now, if we if we perform the computation that I carried out on the last blackboard. Of course, you have to take higher derivatives, and then we have to apply the chain rule and product rule several times. But in the end, open, using Taylor approximation, um, using the distance to v zero, we arrive at a combination of terms which have involved derivatives of tau <coughs> and certain powers of r. And these, using this function here. Cancel, so they, add, they they multiply to a constant, but then I have the additional factor one over um, absolute value of delta, since I use this specific cutoff function here, and this saves our day, letting delta go to zero. Then uh, the difference of these partial derivatives of this function with respect to x. To, so taking the difference of this thing um, to um, the uh, derivative in x direction of these deformation functions, large f, and then we have a huge term which can be estimated and can be made arbitrarily small. And the key example before this um, actually is the computation more or less. Of course, one has to be a little bit more careful with all the higher derivatives here. And um, but that's the local deformation lemma. And now if V0 is an arbitrary closed subset, the proof gets much more complicated. And the problem is 
that the distance function to v0 is then no longer a smooth function. So we cannot simply plug it in here. Or we can do, but then this function here um, is not smooth anymore with respect to x, or not even differentiable. And for uh, dealing with this case, which I do not want to explain in detail now, uh, we introduced the concept of so-called generalized tangent spaces. Um, I just give maybe a, a hint what I mean by this. Um, so if V0 is just a closed subset, use generalized tangent spaces. So with no further structure here, um, just a closed subset, namely we can define the tangent space at x as the intersection of differentials. So I have to make sure that I don't uh, write something wrong. It's a little tricky. Um, take the kernel of differentials of functions h and h. So these are um, smooth germs of functions defined in small neighborhoods. Maybe I should uh, take a different letter here. Um, so this is a neighborhood of um, V0. Um, such that mm, yeah, the function H restricted to W intersecting V0 is actually zero, right? So this is defined by this kind of universal property. It's um, a subset of the tangent space of V of the smooth manifold at the point X. And um, this means if you have any smooth function, which, which is defined on V around X and which vanishes on V zero, then um, the differential of this function vanishes on this linear subspace. Yeah. So this is, something that we can do for any, actually for any subset, it needn't be even closed. So this is a C1 function. And um, using this concept, we can actually write a stratification of V0 into subsets, which as re in respect to, or with respect to this, this um, cutoff scheme here, um, behave like, smooth manifolds, or at least C1 manifolds of increasing dimension. So we can use these, these generalized tangent spaces to first locally define this cutoff function here, and then we paste it together over the whole space V0 to get a function, um, a cutoff function, which in the end, in the computation, has the same properties concerning a vanishing orders like this function here. So um, this is something that I wanted to mention here. So the closed, uh, the case of closed V0, this uh, needs really um, a lot of additional care. And, uh, but I think for the first, for, uh, for the first moment, it's enough to, to understand and to, um, yeah, enjoy the theorem for smooth V0, because then we can just work with the distance function and then it's very easy to, to write down what's going on. Um, so now I would like to um, switch to the um, Beamer talk. So are there any further questions? Um, do you have any problem with when V0 is not compact? Like, I mean, you could- No, um, I mean, if, right, so so this proof here, so here I write a closed V0, so this uh, this means I can just take 
um, one, I can work with one epsilon for the whole thing. If V0 is just a smooth sub-manifold, it's not much worse. Actually, then we have to adapt the, the epsilon along the manifold. So this is this is not, not a big deal. But couldn't your like original solution F not like approach the boundary of your partial differential relation as you go off to infinity? And then you mm, have, like, no 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 uh, actually uh, so that's a good question. I, of course you also have to adapt the delta. As you move along v0, if you if you move um, uh, to infinity uh, uh, within v0, then you also have to make delta smaller so that you so such that this kind of difference term gets smaller and smaller and you stay in the relation. That's okay. fine. So 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 that is that is not a big problem. All these things are um, kind of rather technical, I would say. But taking the closed case here, this is um, this uh, was really um, a very hard thing to achieve, and we were actually astonished that in the end it, it worked out fine. Um, okay. So yeah. Naive question on that. Just because uh, probably probably tried. So why does it work if you if you take a small neighbor, neighborhood of B zero and smooth it? No. <laughs> Yeah, the, I mean, we have to figure this out in detail. This doesn't work. I, so, um, I don't know if, of course, we know that there are approximations to the distance function with several um, nice properties, but uh, we couldn't achieve to do anything kind of uh, directly to write down uh, a distance function which has the correct behavior. So what we need to do is that the k derivative of the distance function, so that, um, that uh, behaves something like r to the one minus k, right? And I mean, we didn't, so in general, it's, um, we couldn't find an approximation for, for arbitrary closed subsets. But, but uh, there's a kind of like general fact if, if you have a closed subset and, and you have a function which vanishes on this closed subset with k, k j, then there exists a, a neighborhood such that this function that its k norm, k norm is less than. Yeah, that. but we just fix the k minus one j during the deformation. Yes, I think yes, I think the yeah. k minus one yeah. will be less than. Uh, right. Mm, no, um, no, this is. I mean, this is exactly what I did on the first blackboard. So, so we have the vanishing. We we control the one jet. Of course, um, uh, the function behaves like R. And then I have this, um, I mean, if I work with this cutoff function here, then everything is fine, of course. But um, I mean, how would you now uh, kind of make a simple uh, approach to this, to control? Uh, you, you kind of just forget about any differential relation, just kind of like question about like, uh, probably maybe it's Whitney you can study this, right? So kind of like if you have a, Function. Okay, well, anyway, we can talk about it. Yes, uh, let's do that. So, so I, I would like to present you some applications of this. And um, of course, we can. Um, now something is good. Okay. Uh, so let's see what we can do with this information scheme. Click on your slides uh, if you're having problems advancing it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. It's, it's, it's fine. Um, so maybe I should mention that this. Theorem that I wrote down is a sort of flexibility. We call it lo local flexibility in MO, Gromov calls it like that. And of course, this has to do with the question which yeah, um, microflexible sheaves are, are flexible. And we know from the polynomial approximation theorem that this is no problem as long as we work over subsets or subpolyhedra of our given manifold of co-dimension at least one. 
And the point here is that we work over the whole manifold V without any um, higher co dimension. So I think this is the kind of the main difference to the usual flexibility lemma or the uh, hol holonomic approximation. And in some sense, uh, this fact here, it captures um, yeah, more or less all we can do in, in the full dimensional case if we, want, if, if we want to study the question which local deformations can be extended to global deformations. Okay, so this, um, yeah, so um, as I, I told you, uh, Gromov stated this in 86, actually it's an exercise, exercise A, this is the, um, the formulation of the local flexibility lemma. And um, here it's actually a slightly different formulation, which I called, uh, uh, could have used also, namely that a certain restriction map of global um, yeah, uh, uh, sections of our given fiber bundle to germs around V0 solving a given partial differential relation. So this should be um, a Serre vibration, or this is a Serre vibration. Being a Serre vibration is nothing else than having this extension property that I uh, wrote down at the, uh, at the blackboard. Okay, so this is um, the um, local flexibility lemma. And uh, for example, there is a nice application in scalar curvature geometry. Namely, we study um, uh, a Riemannian matrix with lower scalar curvature bounds. This is kind of the hard direction because upper scalar curvature bounds, that's a complete flexible uh, property, but lower scalar curvature bounds is not. And so let's take a smooth manifold with compact boundary. Let's take some real number. And here I study spaces of uh, Riemannian metrics on this manifold um, whose scalar curvature is bounded below by C. And I add some additional conditions along the boundary. Namely here, I add um, uh, that the boundary should be mean convex. And here I add a stronger condition, namely that the boundary is totally geodesic. So then it's also mean convex because the um, a mean curvature is zero, but here it's just uh, the mean curvature is bounded below or it's, it's non-negative. And then uh, since this is um, a stronger condition, I have an inclusion of uh, this space in, in the larger space of the Riemannian matrix. And this inclusion turns out to be um, homotopy equivalence or weak homotopy equivalence. Um, so this means that so weak homotopy equivalence means that in each degree it induces an isomorphism of homotopy groups in that degree. And uh, proving this statement here uses the local flexibility lemma around the boundary, uh, namely for the partial differential relation that the scalar curvature of a Riemannian metric is strictly larger than C. And uh, so we use this flexibility lemma in families. So when we want to prove uh, uh, weak homotopy equivalences or have to establish that, then we have to use um, uh, H principles of, of flexibility properties in, in, in families. Since this statement here basically means if we have a map from the K disk into that space, into the larger space, such that the boundary of that disk is mapped to the smaller space, then we find a deformation of this family um, into a family which completely lands in the smaller space while keeping along the boundary uh, the family in this um, smaller space throughout the deformation. And this can be done using um, a family version of the local flexibility lemma and also a relative version, which I didn't say it, but that's, that's not a big deal. So, so, so is it correct that you just write down explicitly the solution at the boundary then and then use your extension? Yes, right. So, so, so that's always the kind of the procedure. One writes down an explicit deformation along the subset V0, and then we can use the local flexibility lemma as a black box to extend it. But there is one thing we have to be careful about. Remember that since this is a second order differential relation, we have to uh, keep the one jet constant. And here I exactly interested in changing the one jet. And actually, so this is a little bit a lie or it's, it's too short. So we use this flexibility lemma 
to bring the metric around the boundary into a standard form, which has a huge second derivative. So it's in kind of in convenient form. And then after that, starting from that specific form, we write down a deformation which takes care of the one jet. So the proof actually has sec two parts. And this is typical. So the local flexibility lemma usually is not enough to completely solve a, a geometric problem, but it's a very good piece that you uh, that makes your life much easier in, 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 in many situations. Okay, so and uh, this kind of deformation properties, this has been studied before by, by um, many authors actually. And I think this is um, kind of a more um, systematic approach to this. And none of these could prove that this is actually really a, a homotopy equivalent. So for this, we really need a relative deformation scheme, uh, which they couldn't uh, write down. Okay, and um, so I talked about open partial differential relations. Sometimes we can also deal with closed relations, for example, taking closed differential forms. And here I have an example, which is maybe uh, uh, yeah, of your um, interest, since we are dealing with uh, closed differential forms, which are related to geometric structures on manifolds. Let's take a submanifold, closed as a subset, and um, let's take an open neighborhood of this uh, submanifold. And now I write down some relation, for example, for being a subjective form, a non-degeneracy condition. So we take an open subset of the uh, space of uh, uh, um, differential p-forms. And now I take uh, a closed form solving this relation. This is just to give uh, an example here. And let's take a smooth path of closed forms solving this relation um, around the subset V0, starting at the given um, uh, at the given form. And then we can extend this uh, local deformation to a global deformation uh, without changing it near V0. And of course, this uh, such a property is well known. So here I have some examples, for example, in uh, in the even dimensional case, we can talk about symplectic structures. This is the, this condition here. And uh, we have a same, the same uh, property using uh, the Moser trick, it's a well known, to, which also yields such an extension result. But here, for example, for G2 structures, which also fall, falls under this scheme, we cannot use the Moser trick like argument since uh, G2 structures uh, define local, I mean, they define Riemannian metric metrics and therefore uh, we have local invariants which are preserved under pullback um, along the geomorphisms. And uh, so using this somewhat different uh, perspective on this uh, uh, on such deformation results, we can also deal with with structures like this. And um, now uh, at last I would like to tell you a little bit about um, uh, an approximation result in Riemannian geometry. Namely, uh, just to give a reminder, if we have a smooth manifold, some Riemannian metric, we can ask to what extent uh, does the metric control the topology or the shape of the manifold? And this depends on the order of differentiability. This is of course well known. So if we have curvature available, so if the metric in particular is at least C2, then we have strong restrictions of the global shape in terms of, um, uh, yeah, of, uh, for example, if I take isometric embeddings into Rn, and it's clear it cannot be arbitrarily small because then I would have a, a large curvature at some point and things like that. Um, but for lower regularity, we have the, for example, the Nash Kolper theorem is, of course, the, um, a famous example that there we have a, more flexibility available. And here uh, on the following slides, I would like to discuss um, this flexibility property from a slightly different angle in terms of an approximation theorem in jet space theory. At first, I would like to um, uh, state this in, in general and, and also prove it on the next slide. And then I, I will treat the case of Riemannian metrics as a special application. So we, now we talk about vector bundles. We take a smooth vector bundle over V. And here I take an arbitrary subsheaf of the sheaf of CK sections. I'm not talking about open partial differential relations anymore. So this can be also 
are defined by a, a closed subset of the sheep uh, of the of the um, uh, jet space. So this is just something. For example, I could take the subsheep of analytic uh, sections or something like that. Okay, so then um, I introduce this notation here. So these are sections. Okay, this is not so good. Um, these are sections um, where, whose value lies in JK of gamma. And uh, here I have an approximation result saying that um, I can approximate each section uh, by a section which satisfies uh, this property here. So lying in the subsheaf over a dense open subset. This is always possible. And um, instead of giving the proof, I um, will give you this application here. If I have a smooth manifold and a C2 Riemannian metric on this manifold, then I always find a metric which lies in an arbitrarily close neighborhood in the C1 topology of that given metric. It has C11 Lipschitz regularity. And on a dense open subset, it has, for example, constant sectional curvature. Right. So this is um, the kind of result which we can prove using this approximation theorem. And this is somewhat um, amazing since the gauss bonnet theorem holds for C11 metrics. And um, unless we want to run into a contradiction, um, we have to make sure that this open dense subset is not a full measure. And of course, in general, it isn't. Otherwise, the theorem wouldn't be true. An open dense, but this is still count, quite counterintuitive. And we see that this is a kind of threshold, the one one regularity. Um, uh, with this, I can achieve uh, to have this, this kind of highly overdetermined partial differential relation over the open um, uh, over an open dense subset. And um, so I would like to. Um, Okay, so now that's over. Um, I can. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a little surprising because um, I started with the full uh, uh, here. But I mean, this was the last slide anyway. And um, I would like to mention two papers where uh, you can read details about this. I don't know if one can see this here. The first paper is. Um, um, called open um, local flexibility or open partial differential relations. This is um, there to appear in the communications. Right. Uh, so it's, um, you can see it's an early view mode when you look at the web page of this journal. And there is also a video abstract available. And the second paper is, um, uh, boundary conditions for scalar curvature. So that's this. There, and it's available on the archive. I forgot the number. And also, we have a video abstract of this. Right, so this one was produced by um, Wiley uh, Publisher Company, and this we produced ourselves. You can decide yourself which one you prefer. And um, yeah, so that's. Uh, Basically, it. 
Thank you. Just a really dumb question. What's a video abstract? Um, I mean, you can have a look at it. It's great fun and you will enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. So the first one, which is produced kind of professionally, very fancy that there are um, mathematical symbols floating around, but it's also a kind of a professional voice that explains some aspects of our paper. And it's actually quite nice to uh, look at it. It's uh, three minutes. And this one, um, so the, I did it with Christian Baer and we, we are sitting there in, in chairs and uh, explaining the, the theorem or the, the content of our paper to the audience. And in the background, there are um, mathematical illustrations that help uh, understanding it. It's also a few minutes. So if you don't want to read an abstract, you can look at the video abstract. <laughs> I'll take a look for sure. Yes. Yeah, good. I appreciate it. So is it correct that in the applications you're always using V0 as smooths and manifold? Exactly. So this is a point I, I have to make. Um, although um, the proof of a local flexibility lemma was extremely hard for arbitrarily closed subsets V0, and we are convinced that there is interesting mathematics going on, we haven't found a striking application of this general case yet. Um, but there should be some. I, I mean, this is, of course, a, a speculation, but um, th there's something non-trivial going on. But I mean, it can be applied in order to, um, uh, for some use local flexibility dilemma uh, for manifolds with corners. Um, that's a first application, and this is uh, then. Um, but we haven't done anything in this direction yet. Yes. Can you describe like how you prescribe the scalar curvature near the boundary, like which is close and C1 to the original matter? Like that's what you need, right? To you, uh, you are talking about the last theorem yeah, yeah, yeah. on the last slide. Yeah. Okay, I can do that. That's the proof of this approximation theorem, um, basically. Uh, take um, a dense subset of points in, in, in your manifold, and then we use an iterative process. We start at one point, we deform the metric around this point, bring it into form like a sectional curvature constant, something you like, positive or negative, uh, while keeping the one jet constant. And this can be done in, in normal coordinates. If you work in normal coordinates, then you can just um, uh, construct, you, you can move your initial metric around this point to a metric with some strong curvature properties while keeping the one jet constant at the point. I see. Okay. Yes. And then, uh, um, and so we do this in a small neighborhood and then we apply the local flexibility lemma and we do this iteratively. Yeah, just not getting it near that point. I was yes, wondering. yes. Uh, but that's a good thing because this was on my, uh, one of my slides, which um, were too, <laughs> too much for my computer. <laughs> Okay, if there are no further questions, I guess we earn our lunch now.